So thank you for everyone for joining us today. I'm Cousin Chang, the Assistant Curator at Parasite Hong Kong. So uh, today we are very happy to have uh, the curators of the Korean show Liquid Ground, Alvin Lee and also Julian Fong, as well as uh, this, uh, this uh, public program's uh, artist, Jan Meller, which is a duo of uh, Royce Ng and also Daisy Bisnix. So, uh, before uh, talking about the program, I, for those who may not be too familiar with Parasite, I just want to give a little brief introduction of our organization. So uh, Parasite has been in Hong Kong for 25 years as a local art center. And for a quarter of a century, we've been producing uh, critical uh, exhibitions and also programs and conferences to really uh, you know, initiate different kinds of engagement and discussion on critical issues, particularly in the Asia Pacific region. So currently we have our exhibition called Liquid Ground, uh, which lasts until uh, 14th of November. And of course it is co-curated by our two speakers today, Alvin Lee and Julian Fong, and the exhibition consists of 15 artists. So uh, just to give a brief introduction of the curators, Alvin Lee is a writer and contributing editor at Freeze Magazine, and also the adjunct curator, Greater China, supported by Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation at Tate. He currently serves as artistic advisor for the 59th International Art Exhibition of uh, La Biniala Venezia. And Lee's, uh, Alvin is also writing on a lot of, a lot of uh, contemporary art and culture, and, and these uh, uh, writings appeared in uh, Freeze, Art Forum, and Eflux, for example. And uh, for Julian, he's an artist and writer based in Shanghai, China. He received his uh, BS in Physics from Fudan University and NFA from the University of Pennsylvania. His recent projects and exhibitions include an impulsive turn, in uh, Inside Out Art Museum Beijing in 2020, and uh, Hickson Leonis uh, at 798 Art Center Beijing 2019, for example. So uh, without further ado, I would love to pass uh, this to Alvin and Julian to start introducing uh, John Meller and also to initiate the discussion on the public program. Uh, thank you, Cousin. So uh, my name is Alvin Lee, and I'm one of the co-curators of the exhibition. Um, I guess the idea for Liquid Ground was born towards the end of 2019 when Julian and I were having a lot of conversations around, um, you know, subjects such as material transformation, energy, and geoengineering in the urban context. And around this time, we kind of stumbled upon um, Lantau Tomorrow Vision, which is this, you know, to us very dubious land reclamation project proposed in 2018 by Hong Kong authorities that aimed to reclaim 1,700 hectares from the sea and turn Lantau into Hong Kong's third economic hub, um, hopefully by 2030, um, which is you know a few decades before the supposed drowning of many Asian cities. Um, so, and this plan became the kind of curatorial jumping off points for us to think through together with the artists and collectives in the show, a range of uh, transversal and interrelated themes such as you know, the developmentalist statecraft that fuels urban planning, the Western modernist ideal of progress, the abuse of earth materials, and the kind of anthropocentrism behind such vision and drive to terraform at the expense of multi-species diversity. To develop this project, we were very eager to work with artists in Hong Kong, and especially artists actually living and working on Lantau Island, and we're very happy to have both Zhou Mala and Zhou Bo, two Lantau residents, to contribute new to, to the show. Um, for, for which they have both ventured beyond the city to give voice to the non-human, uh, the fauna and flora local to Lantau Island. Um, today's public program is the first in a series of events that will take place throughout the exhibition period um, that will take audiences outside of the exhibition space to occupy different corners of the city to see and hear a new and sense our ecological enmeshment. Um, and just to, a quick word that on Saturday, the September 25th, uh, Zheng Bo, We'll, we'll be leading a sketching exercise on Lantau and we'll organize shuttle bus to pick up RSVP guests from Parasite to the island. And for more information, please stay tuned to our website. And I now I will pass it to Julian to introduce the artist and this work. Hello, um, I'm Julian and one of the co-curators of the show. 
So I think right now I'm going to give a brief introduction to the artists and uh, the com new commission work. So uh, Jim Mala, uh, are an artist, Royce and, and anthropologist Daisy Biesenix, a duo working together on research intensive community based site specific projects, often utilizing digital media performances and installation to explore relationships between art and research practice, drawing from each other's respective backgrounds. They examine the limits as well as the methods and strategies of expanding both their familiar disciplines while experimenting with new interdisciplinary possibilities of cross pollinations. Where anthropological approaches are applied to art practice and artistic methodologies are utilized as research exercises in the studies of anthropology. Together, they have exhibited, performed, and participated in numerous art spaces, institutions, and residences, working alongside various communities in Australia, Asia, Africa, Europe, and the US. Um, so I'm going to just quickly pass through some pictures of the show overall. And um, just to go to the, the uh, commission work, uh, Bobulus Bubalis, 16 to 40,000 hertz um, by Jamala. So this newly commissioned project is informed by Bisonic's graduate thesis in anthro anthrozoology, which looked into ways landhouse geography and wetland ecology have been shaped by bovid, water buffalo, and cow populations. Once known as the rice basket of Hong Kong, Lantau suffered substantial agricultural decline in the 1970s and 80s when water buffalo and cattle once kept for agricultural labor were released into the wild and became feral. These non-human agents, water buffalo, i.e. Bobulus bobalis in particular, have terraformed their landscape, turning abandoned farmland into biodiverse wetland ecologies. This delicate, spontaneous web of life thus created will soon fall under siege as Land How Tomorrow Vision, the land reclamation mega project, continue its course. The exhibition room is an assemblage of the instruments used in their research. It features a sound sculpture consisting of few recordings the artists collected by following the wandering buffalo on the island. Uh, by by not by by on by our by microphone, by Nauru, microphone was constructed, replicating the forms of buffalo ears using three D scanning and printing to capture the sonic perception of an animal physiognomy. The recordings are split into two sets. The ultrasonic frequencies only the buffalo can hear are presented visually through the Schlantley plate. Uh, translating the vibrations into animated intricate patterns of water ripples. The frequency within human hearing range can be experienced through headphones connected to the binocular uh, buffalo mic, giving the audience a specialized experience of buffalo hearing. And selected text from the artist's uh, background research and field, field notes is documented in a companion booklet. The work initiates a developing series of multi-species sensory ethnographies around Lantau Island's ecosystem and is an attempt to acknowledge the limitations of human sensory capacities and how technology can be used to mediate these constraints and embody more than human experience. Uh, so I guess right now I'm going to pass on to uh, our parasite staff, uh, who's also going to play the uh, recorded uh, video of the of the field field uh, work uh, that uh, our uh, colleague An Chi, who was uh, the Parasites uh, public program curator before, and so Sherman, uh, could you start? Sure. Oh, Just I'm to start. Please say that the recording that will start uh, is roughly about 30, 35 minutes. Um, so during this period, I think we can all mute ourselves and enjoy this well trip to Lantau. And then afterwards, we'll come back and have a conversation with the artists. Hello, 
this is Anchi. I'm curator of education and public programs from Parasite. Today we have a very special student visit. We're not on the island of Hong Kong, but actually we're at Meiwo of Lantau Island. Um, I would like to introduce um, the artist group Jamila, and we have Daisy here, and also we have Rose here today. So Daisy and Rose, would you like to tell us why we're here at Mayville? So. We moved to Hong Kong eight years ago, and uh, we decided we wanted to live on one of the islands. And actually, we originally thought that Lama would be a nice place, but then uh, the family friend recommended to come to Lantau and have a look, specifically Mui War. And uh, we came and experienced the local wildlife and the beach and the mountains here and the incredibly cheap rent <laughs> so we decided yeah this is a good place to set up a base so we've been here since and uh so i think the one of the major parts for me uh was uh, at the time i was uh, looking to do my master's in anthropology and particularly anthropology and I thought seeing this interesting coexistence between water buffaloes and uh, free roaming cattle here was, would make an interesting case study for my master's research. Mm -hmm. and, and at that time, yeah, we were at the forest mentioned we were thinking of relocating to somewhere close to the mountains, to the ocean. Um, where I grew up in Australia, I was grew up in the mountains, so I wanted to be close to nature. And then we thought, yeah, there's kind of typical boxes. And now we're really walking between the hills on the beautiful grassland. And do we have a mission here today? Like, what are we looking for? Uh, so we're going to take you for a little room <laughs> around the quite, co the quite uh, common areas that the water buffalo um, like to visit and spend time in. So kind of trace their path, mm -hmm. um, which was the subject of my research. Um, Should we go this way? Looking at uh, so yeah, I was looking at um, just the history of the coexistence of the water buffalo and cattle here mm -hmm. um, with the human communities, and what was what was one particular thing that. Um, drew attention to me was the kind of uh, movements of flows and the paths that were being co-created by humans and the water buffalo together. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, now we're in the space of where we are now in these fields. These are all kind of rice farming, vegetable farming fields, um, which over time the free-roaming cattle and buffalo have terraformed mm -hmm. into kind of more viable wetlands and ecology. You can see around here there's mushrooms, um, there's a lot of bird life, a lot of insect life, and um, various plants. Yeah, look at here. Very noisy. Yeah. And, and when you hear these sounds, that's a sign of a very healthy ecology. Yeah. So this is as a result of human and water buffalo and cattle activity, and then being able just to do um, their thing, their okay. solidary nature, which is just free roaming yeah. and around. And having humans let, let the human uh, having humans let them do that in the river. Really. So you can uh, see one over there. Oh, yeah. So um, cows and buffaloes belong to the bovid bovidae family. Yeah. And as a species you've got Bosphorus, which is the cattle, and they have I mean they're quite physiologi physically different, so um, cows will have like a furry skin. Uh-huh. Um, they're a little bit smaller. Okay. And they'll mostly be kind of brown black colour and water buffaloes are a lot bigger. Um, they're the bubulus bubulus 
and uh, they have um, mostly skin and a little bit of fur, uh, a little bit of hair, I would say, not even fur. And water buffalo love wallowing in water with yeah. cows don't. Yeah. <laughs> I see, I see. <laughs> they prefer to stay dry and away because um, just physically they're not built for moving in water and uh-huh. water buffalo have um, over time just evolved to adapt to more liquid environments and <laughs> marshlands and wetlands and um, and that's why they were used particularly they were uh, mostly used for rice farming to mm-hmm. plow the rice fields where mm-hmm. cows were used more for draft labor so being I pulling see. carts mm-hmm. and more transport um, so I mean in the, in a lot of villages in Hong Kong especially in Lantau um, buffaloes were considered a lot more valuable um, and they were, they were kind of considered the BMWs and the, the cows were considered the Toyotas so they were a little bit more hardy and reliable but the buffalo were super valuable for ploughing fields and were often shared between families because they were quite valuable so not everyone could own one so the labour was shared actually I see um, yeah so that's a little bit of the, just the history the farming history um, so super super important for the economy the like farming economies here so if we're looking at um, yeah. this some brand the over there, yeah. um, so it's a wild animal, right? It's well, this is the interesting not. thing because this is what I found fascinating about this yeah. particular case study is that they kind of define definition. I would say they uh, kind of uh, resist definition, let's I see. say. So, you know, from it depends on who you talk to. Some people see it as they're rewilding the landscape. Uh-huh. Some people say that they're feral. Some people they say they're stray. Some people think okay. they're um, like neighbors. Yeah. Um, so everyone has various perspectives, and it often says a lot about their sense of belonging from mm-hmm. a human perspective, where True. they're situated in mm-hmm. relationship to people. Um, you know, before when they were part of family they were often considered family yes and they would actually dwell in the living rooms of a lot of farming oh, places really? so there was I see. it was a very close affection because mm-hmm. they were so important for making money and growing food yeah um, so it says a lot about where where they are situated in particular relationship and the values that are, you know humans often put onto that relationship I see. yeah but for buffaloes and that's interesting too because they're not necessarily wild because they're so used to people mm-hmm. um, yet they have their own distance as well so I find this proximity this like um, tension between this uh, connection and separateness very interesting to explore okay. and how we how we can live together too like this is a very unique situation that you know for most people in the world um, these days and it's considered a post-domestic environment where mm-hmm. we're past that domestic domestication process but this is a new kind of domestication process happening where we're learning to live alongside maybe animals that we haven't lived in modern times you know so for a lot of people cows and buffaloes would be animals that you eat and often oh, separated true, yeah. we don't have any relationship with the food yeah. that food source anymore but in this this way now they're actually they have their own families they're living in their own ways following their own behaviors alongside humans so what does that mean what kind of experience does this create Mm -hmm. Um, what kind of conflicts and the tensions that arise from that the perceptions that arise from that and the spectrum of those perceptions like looking at all that too yeah so that's what I I found fascinating um, and I wanted to kind of explore deeper with that research Mm -hmm. during my anthropology masters I somehow think of the animation, uh, Japanese animation, My Neighbor Toto. Yeah, right. Although like, Toto is like relatively smaller mm. or can be like huge, uh, a neighbor. But also to the buffaloes or to the cows here in Lantau Island, is they're also actually living with us, right. not only next right. to us. Yeah. Right? And like Lantau is, well, it's distance from um, like the urban scenes of Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. It's not so close like from uh, Kowloon or from uh, Hong Kong Island but right. still in one region it's still really close yeah we can like for example we took the ferry here today we can also take bus we can also take other t- transportation right but it's so fascinating because we don't see this unique relationship between yeah. human and animals and also, especially yeah. large animals like yeah, buffaloes exactly and I think that causes a lot of um, anxiety with people mm. because we're so used to being the biggest animal in our environment that's true so a lot of the tensions arise here in just the movements and flows that come with living with bigger bodied animals like 
buffaloes. Mm -hmm. And there is, you know, for a lot of people, there's legitimate um, feelings because of their behavior and their nature of just being buffaloes too. But it's also how do we coexist? How do we negotiate? those flows and movements together yeah. especially on bicycle paths especially on roads yeah. especially amongst the houses um, and a lot of these paths that's what's fascinating too, a lot of these paths and roads and even the hiking paths up the mountains were initially cultivated by um, uh, uh, grazing buffaloes and cows mm. so there's this layering process too, so traditionally the cows and buffaloes helped define the properties here exactly, yeah. because they were all farming plots connected with other families and that their movements helped connect a village and mm -hmm. helped connect a community mm -hmm. um, and the same with grazing so but now like now that the farming is past yeah. the, 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 the biggest industry of farming is past the paths that the animals have helped create are being used in a different way mm -hmm. um, by them and also by us yes and that's that's a beautiful thing to you know ex like see that history like there's a constant layering a constant um building of a yeah a relationship over time um rather than as just this like one static relationship and it shows that um you know even in our embodiments different embodiments as human or animals they actually change over time to our relations with our relationships and with the environment mm -hmm. um so yeah that's that that's what's been uh yeah There's some water buffaloes. This is one of their favorite spots during the day. Oh, it's quite cool and it's out of the way of people. Um, this is all farming land, so now you can see it's kind of in when it rains, this is all quite wet land. It's okay. very marshy, a lot of frogs, a lot of um, bird life. <laughs> yes. So during the day, especially like in the heat of the day, like this, they'll, you'll see they're quite wet, they're just happy to wallow, um, and that keeps their skin protected and from the sun and from like um, insects mm -hmm. so it's like ah. natural sunscreen <laughs> exactly yeah nice. so mud <laughs> is like their way of like protecting themselves because they have exposed skin they don't have fur yeah so it's like an extra layer of protection and it keeps them cool because they um, they struggle releasing heat mm -hmm. so there's a way of like having a cold mud pack it helps regulate their body temperatures as well it's really hot. Yeah. Here. Kind of wish I had. Have we can go to that. <laughs> we can go to that tree and see so the shade. Oh, yeah. uh, these are some of their like little baths that they do. Oh, they made by themselves. Yeah. Okay. Because yesterday it just ran. So yeah. So they they probably moved and they probably just keep active over here. That's true. Yeah. They're all staring at us. <laughs> They hear noises. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Wow. So their their hearing range is super, super sensitive. They can hear things between 16 and 42,000 hertz, which is more than uh, so it's higher than our like what we can hear and lower. Mm -hmm. And um, interesting thing about like herd animals like water buffaloes or elephants that. They um, they use the earth more for hearing sounds mm -hmm. so through vibration. Of low frequencies. Low frequencies. And that's actually a strategy to keep the herd together. And so if they are separated, then they know kind of the, the positions of where everyone is and they can keep safe. Um, and also um, their, their call for like feeding or location, like to know is a, uh, that it helps for to travel over long distances too. So I think that, yeah, the impetus for doing this project for Parasite yeah. um, was building on this research that I initially conducted about the socio-cultural environmental history here and thinking about, um, you know, an, an additional layer to make a multi-species ethnography. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you think about working with multi-species communities, it's often, okay, something more than human 
and a modern human way of being in the world. And mm -hmm. often that isn't through the senses. Yeah. And so we're thinking about the strength of a buffalo's existence and how it lives in its world is through sound, particularly, and hearing. Yeah, so that's why we decided to focus through sound and highlight that kind of uh, that sensory experience mm -hmm. in um, perhaps understanding how yeah, they live in their environment and especially uh, uh, through yeah, different mediums, like mostly through the earth and through water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. So yeah, uh, we know that uh, Daisy and also Royce, your work is going to be in our next exhibition, Liquid Ground. So uh, we know it's going to be sound related. Um, do you want to give us maybe a spoil? Or like how it will look like or like how would you like to invite people to come to Parasite to see your work? Yeah, so the idea behind the work was um, yeah, to try and provide a more than human uh, experience of the landscape from the perspective of the water buffalo. So we decided to focus uh, on their hearing and, um, and Daisy having discovered the fact that uh, the hearing of the water buffalo is uh, in ranges high above and, and far below those of humans. So humans can hear from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, mm -hmm. whereas uh, buffaloes can hear from 16 hertz to 42,000 hertz. So it's in, especially in high frequencies, it's almost double the range yeah. and quite a bit lower than humans. And we thought, um, what's a way that we can communicate or allow the audience to experience this uh, mm. a different body, a different bodily sensation. Yeah. Um, and so we've, we're in the midst of building a um, buffalo ear binaural micro, ultrasonic binaural microphone. Mm. So that's com basically we um, 3D scanned um, the ears of a buffalo and use that as a basis to model an accurate replica and we 3D printed that and then um, we have binaural microphones which we're inserting that and so the idea of binaural um, recording is like this one we have here and this is based on human ears mm -hmm. so essentially you're trying to replicate uh, uh, the three-dimensional uh, hearing experience of a human being so it's two, mi two uh, uh, 360 degree microphones placed in the position approximately where the human ears are and so when you listen to that recording in headphones it actually recreates a kind of spatial sonic landscape um, so what we're doing is we're creating a binaural microphone which mirrors the dimensions of a buffalo water buffalo's yeah. ears so they have 50 centimeters between each ear um, and they have a completely obviously different anatomy to their ear um, and different relationship to the skull. So we're developing that and we're combining that with the ultrasonic microphone, which can um, record uh, up to 100 kilohertz, mm -hmm. which is far beyond uh, what a, even a water buffalo can hear. But the, 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 the microphone we ended up buying is actually developed for recording bat calls. Um, bats use, you know, echolocation, they can hear yes. and emit sounds up to 100 uh, kilohertz and so we uh, are using that combined with a spectrogram to make a kind of ultrasonic record of how a water buffalo would experience that landscape but then the, uh, the key issue is how do you com communicate um, uh, a sensation uh, a sensory experience that humans actually are incapable mm -hmm. of uh, experiencing because our hearing again only goes up to 20,000 hertz so we're actually creating a what's called a cladney plate so it's basically a, a piece of metal attached to a speaker mm -hmm. and so we'll be playing the um, ultrasonic recordings field recordings um, in the landscape that the buffalo peruse yeah. um, through these speakers attached to this metal plate and the ultrasonic vibrations will be translated onto the metal and then if you put any medium on top of that metal that's translated into uh, visible vibrations that we can see 
so we're using water and possibly sand mm -hmm. on top of the metal and uh, the ultrasonic vibrations will create these kind of ripples and patterns which actually follow really interesting kind of uh, natural kind of formations in physics um, and are quite beautiful mm -hmm. so we're using that method to you know, communicate to the audience how the um, water buffalo experience yeah. the landscape sonically. It also draws attention to our limitations, our like, sensory limitations by you know, our, our strongest sense is often sight. So yes. uh, yeah, we're limited by that particular experience and just maybe communicating that like, this, is, this is the limitation that we have to deal with. Um, there are other ways of experiencing the world that will defy our comprehension, always, and we need to be okay with that, actually. Mm. So, uh, would you like recommend people to close their eyes when they're experiencing your work? That would, yeah, I think that's something I'd considered, is like, yeah. how do we, yeah, how do we communicate this um, awareness of that okay. limitation? Yeah. Um, because even in presenting it, we, I mean, just due to other our own like maybe curatorial limitations with time and stuff, we, we we could you know create more of a an ultimate sensory experience. This is more of just an introduction to I the see, idea. I see, of so course, yes. um, okay, so we're limited to this site, but yeah, that's one um, uh, yeah advice that we would probably recommend is like close your eyes, just uh, let your body sink in with yes. <laughs> with whatever you experience in that space or with whatever you experience in, in the sound. Yeah. Um, and the binaural and ultrasonic uh, recordings are really quite um, amazing, like to transport you, yeah. like in, <laughs> they give you a different like spatial experience as well and sensory experience. So hopefully, yeah, we can, we're able to be successful in doing that. Yeah. There, yeah. there will be a visual component, like yeah. visual documentation. Uh, video documentation to accompany the sounds but Nothing. they're not the emphasis of the yeah. piece mm. um, in the same way that vision isn't the um, primary mode through which the water buffalo <laughs> uh, experience the world even though they're all looking at us now they yeah. turned away I think I said their name so they looked up <laughs> um, yeah, I think maybe there was one like particularly like yeah. a security guard. Well, like, and you see that yes, too, yeah. like they're monitoring their landscape yeah. constantly. Like, so it's kind of like they can they're sensing <laughs> they, they, they know we're here and they can feel our presence and hear us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nice. As when we talk I notice they like you know, their ears prick up, their heads prick up. So. Yeah. You know, like I learned a lot of things doing this research. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Um, the reason why the, the buffalo have the eyes on the side of the head yeah. and why um, predators like humans mm -hmm. and like um, big cats have the eyes in front of the head is because the uh, prey animal have to have a greater field of view uh -huh. to be able to know if something's creeping up behind them okay. to attack them. So they have the eyes on the side of the head where they get this kind of 360 degree view of the world but actually the they only see in three dimensions on mm -hmm. um, a narrow field where the two kind of the vision of the two eyes overlaps in the middle and the rest is um, um, two-dimensional okay um, and though they have a tiny little bi blind spot mm -hmm. behind the head oh. which is probably why you know the, 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 the tigers yeah like get in that uh, try to get right in that little spot and and, okay. yeah I see shall we uh, maybe uh, Oh, in the farm? Yeah, there's uh, a guy. There's a few of them. Let's see from the steps, I think. 
music. Yep. Oh, there's two. I think that's three. Oh, three. Oh, yeah, one, two, and then. Oh, yeah, two, two. structure and it's like this is the shop at the end of all the fire. Okay, there's this little sort of structure here. Old one. It's looking way up against it. This was part of like an old cow shed. Okay. That's still remaining. But yeah, I don't know if it's uh, this car and there. It's like one of the old style. Oh okay. Yeah. I can't tell now. This one. This is yeah. the This is the shop. This is the shop. Uh, means that they're being sterilized by the government.
开窝、欸。没有啊，没有。你要你要先要住吗？要住吗？呃，也不用，反正也不用，可以吃 B roll。哦 ，OK， 对，直接开始。They, they hold like bigger public consultations for bigger projects and they're mostly more... Could that maybe you go first? Yeah. Do you want to go first? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're mostly more in the rural township. Yeah. Because that's where, you know, they get visitors and yeah. tourists and stuff. And actually, you know, a long time ago, Moi Wall was like one of the busiest towns on Lantau. Um, and it was the main port for industries and things like the people coming in. So for a long time ago, there was a lot more people living in Moi Wall. And now they want to kind of redevelop it back like that to become like sort of tourism and maybe even eco tourism. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's like balance. I think there's, there's a lot of conversations around balancing that development with you know, uh, preserving the environment as it is, especially for the wildlife. Um, so yeah, a lot of conversations need to be held around that sensitive development issue. Yeah. So these these plants here are actually they haven't got the flowers at the moment, but these are all the water hyacinths. And they with the water buffaloes uh, moving through this landscape that actually helps their growth. Huh. So you see all of the long through these um, these are some oak like, carrow and uh, elephant ear plants that they're, they're quite companion, yeah. companion plants. Um, but this this plant is it does extraordinary things. It helps collect pollution, water runoff, um, helps with flooding, any flooding. So actually it's really quite beneficial to have these green spaces next to like villages like this. Mm -hmm. And the buffaloes, yeah, they, they do the job preserving them. And are there any like villagers who can care? Or like managing Not really. Well. No, no, they don't yeah. need to be managed. They just, I think it's a it's self management. So yeah. <laughs> the buffaloes do their thing, the plants do their thing. Yeah. And as long as it's not interfered with, then it's like it thrives. You can kind of see the buffalo paths. So yeah, you can see the faint paths that they <laughs> It's always nice to discover them. You, you can see where the invisible lines that they leave. Yeah. And along here too. Well, they also intentionally oh, try to there's, walk. There's an example of these flowers, but this is the plant itself. <laughs> right in the middle. Yeah, so sometimes, like, yeah, after the rain, it's just like covered in purple. Uh -huh. it's like, yeah, um, we can even just go out the back and come around, or do you think that's it? Mm, I think we'd. Okay, maybe, I mean, maybe that's it. Maybe. Yeah, it's 512. Okay, I think we're. I think that's it. That's it? Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody. I uh, I think there were the video was a bit choppy on the with the live streaming, and I I apologize for the for the <laughs> limits of the technology. But you know, it, it's kind of fun that had the sense of a slow cinema <laughs> going on. Um, so following the uh, uh, so we're gonna upload the um, in order for us to see it in a better quality, we will upload the the, the field trip to Parasites um, YouTube um, as well for 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 the viewers. Um, yeah, so I guess Julian and I have some questions to um, uh, for 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 Daisy and Voice, and if we still have time after you know the conversation, we might open 
it up to for some uh, for, for the Q and A. Julian, do you wanna? Yeah, I guess um, the first question I've written down is, so uh, as a duo of an artist and an anthropologist, like how do you usually collaborate or what's your like collaboration process and how does this anthropological research aspect and the artistic research uh, reciprocate or uh, supplement each other? Yeah, I guess it's kind of a general question about your um, process and your methodology. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I can start. Um, so yeah, Royce and I, we've been collaborating, wow, since 2009 now. Um, and, you know, we started collaborating because we were often quite interested in similar things, but we found that we were approaching these kind of subjects from different angles, or, but often dealing with similar ideas like representation or how do we, um, you know, produce whatever work we're doing. So the process of actually either writing research and publishing it or producing a manuscript or in terms of doing an exhibition um, uh, as an artist. And, but I think, you know, during this time where if because we we kind of want to play with our respective um, processes um, the way we collaborate is it just it tends to be quite equal in terms of our contributions so you know Royce is also interested in research so we conduct research together in terms of this work um, this this work for Parasite was based on uh, my master's research so this was um, just my research but Previously, you know, we we tend to do the research together, and as Julian said, like, as you said uh, earlier before, that yeah, our practice is quite research intensive. So, so first we kind of conduct research um, based around a subject or, or something we're interested in or an idea we're interested in, um, and then uh, you know, Royce has he's got good technical expertise, 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 and you know, the last few years we've had a child together, and now with the pandemic, so the last few years has enabled. Um, him to kind of um, focus more on kind of the technical aspects and build those skills as well. Um, I tend to do more of the writing or written stuff and maybe kind of uh, defining the scope of the research. Um, but at the same time too, like, uh, you know, we, we're both, we both kind of determine the kind of artistic direction and the vision of whatever realizing the work um, and, and design as well. So like we, design is very much part of that in terms of uh, the research design or, the, you know, exhibition design. Um, yeah, and, you know, in terms of the division of labor too, like, uh, uh, it's quite equal. So, I mean, I can use this parasite work as an example. Um, yeah, so the, the research was based on my master's research. Um, and then Royce, he designed the microphone. Um, but the, the design of the ears was based on my own research in looking into the anatomy of buffaloes. Um, and that was kind of literature based as well as um, observation from my research and also doing some 3D scanning. Um, but then, you know, you know, I, I did the sound recordings for this piece, but then Royce edited those sound recordings and um, helped build the, the, the cardinal plate. Um, and Royce did the, the filming for the video, but then I edited that together. So it's quite equal in terms of like how we collaborate and how we realize the, the work or, or the design and the process. Um, and yeah, and for, I mean, for me personally, as like an anthropologist, as a researcher, I find the medium of an exhibition quite an interesting um, form to uh, communicate a lot of research, which, you know, it's, it opens up to different audiences, more public audiences to share research and ideas that might kind of be not as accessible. Um, and also playing with, you know, writing as well, like in terms of constructing written pieces, like this is where um, I find it, I can kind of test the boundaries of like uh, writing processes and doing more kind of creative fiction writing and speculative fiction. And um, yes, yeah, because it's, you know, write, research writing is still a form of like uh, you're constructing something. So it's playing with those processes and experimenting with those processes. And also I think for a main thing for me too, is like a lot of stuff that's often left out of research writing is the kind of sensory stuff too. So doing, uh, you know, maybe doing exhibitions or realizing ideas in different kind of artistic mediums, it allows for more of that sensory stuff to um, remain in kind of carrying some of this research forward and as a vehicle for that. So yeah, maybe Royce, you can add some comments to that. 
No, I think that's that's quite an ac accurate picture of how we collaborate. Um, the only thing I would add is, uh, I guess, coming more from an arts background, but also having begun in kind of humanities, academia, I studied art history and anthropology in my undergrad. Um, but this is kind of my arts, uh, I guess, a lot of people are involved in trying to define at the moment and it doesn't really have a clear definition but what I find working with Daisy coming from a more um, rigorous uh, academic background is she can kind of provide the the structures and the methodologies like concrete methodologies from ethnography um, from anthropology which can be applied in it just makes it a bit for me it makes it a bit more um, yeah, rigorous and thorough to have that kind of um, structure in which to um, kind of um, sculpt kind of the, the direction of our research. The other thing is um, it's uh, our collaboration is also not just us, like we also always work with a number of people. Um, so uh, Daisy in her um, <clears throat> research with the Bird populations and Lantau worked with a number of people from NGOs and volunteers and everyone um, who have been working with the bird populations here. Um, and on the technological side for this exhibition, I worked with um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Alvaro Casanelli uh, from the School of Creative Media, who helped a lot with the kind of uh, the physics knowledge needed to uh, to create like a water speaker. This kind of um, translating um, infra and ultrasonic frequencies into like vibrations and water actually uh, is beyond my pay grade so uh, yeah we, it's really great to be able to like consult with um, uh, experts in the field and work together with them. Yeah. Oh, um, thank you. Um, um, so one thing I think both Julian and I find very interesting about the work is, you know, this kind of a, a translation process of a sensory experience that humans are not capable of into something we can, um, you know, through the, mm -hmm. the patterns and the vibration on the on the plate. And so in a sense to visualize the limitations of human capacity with the aid of technology. Um, and somehow in this translation, it reminds me of how the notion of sentience is sometimes invoked in the field of bioethics yep. and ongoing debates from like animal rights to, um, to the very definition of life. And I'm curious to what extent this project has to do with this notion of sentience or the notion of empathy, if at all, in, in perceiving a kind of multi-species ecology. Yeah, um, very much actually. So, I mean, this this was a it was a sincere attempt to like um, share maybe more than a, a more than human kind of experience of Lantau's environments. Um, though this was done with also the awareness that you know it's entirely impossible to replicate or or provide like a definitive um, kind of auditory experience of you know the water buffalo. So um, I don't know. I, I feel like there's definitely a need to make peace <laughs> with this kind of human uh, expectation or desire to kind of fully or exaltively know about something or even give a voice to you know um more than more than human kind of uh, beings um you know so it kind of can remain potentially unknowable and be being okay with that and how do we live with something that we might not fully possibly can fully understand um but you know yet like within our human faculties we we, we're cerebral creatures, you know, where we have this ability to um, try or imagine at least or make an empathetic attempts to kind of try and understand. And I think that's a strength that, you know, we, we have as like very cerebral creatures. Um, so, you know, in terms of our co coexistence here on Lantau with, you know, water buffaloes and cows um, and, you know, they're larger body mammals, um, uh, you know, they immediately challenge your kind of uh, sense of physical pre presence in like shared urbanizing spaces. And I don't know, for me, that is, it's an active reminder that we dwell and we're implicated in sentient ecologies. And so these shared spaces, in the, and in these shared spaces, we, we share these elements together, whether it's, you know, um, uh, water, air or earth, and they mediate our perceptions and our relationships and the, the types of engagements we have. 
So in the context of um, like the concept of liquid ground, like we decided to bring attention um, and acknowledge kind of these unique sensory perceptions and experiences, like kind of radical alterities of living and um, of the water buffalo. And like, you know, they, they, they challenge our ideas of what terraforming or land reclamation might mean because, you know, they're wetland landscapers that provides a completely different idea of what development might mean. Um, in terms of like buffalo development as well, you know, they, they're kind of crafting their own landscape for their own needs. So how do we like, you know, dwell in proximity with these other needs? Um, and, and also too, they operate literally like on different oral frequencies and we should be comp completely impervious to our everyday, um, like humanly perceptions, like, but they're very much connected through the movement of, you know, our shared elements. And so, you know, while humans have a hearing range of 20,000 hertz and, and um, water buffalo can hear sounds between 16 and um, 14, 40,000 hertz. So both infra and ultrasonic sounds like, which are essential for like herd communication and their own social lives. So we wanted this work um, for Parasite to, um, yeah, bring attention to our kind of own limitations of our own sensory experiences um, through the buffalo's own powerful ability through hearing and you know think about how these limitations influence um, how we perceive and how we engage uh, with you know with other beings and our environments and, um, yeah so even in like even think about how we uh, we realized this exhibition like there's still a you know there's a with the sound work there's still a reliance through um, a visual um, uh, yeah, like a, there's still a reliance on the visual aspect. So, you know, through the Cladney plate, um, the film, the text, um, and the technological devices as well, like in terms of the installation. And I mean, that kind of, for me, that draws attention that we still have the, this is still our very much our world. Um, but the, you know, the, it's nice to have this exercise of perhaps like bringing different perspectives um, to cultivate like, you know, the sensibility of, you know, our environments that we exist in and, and other beings maybe we coexist with. Yeah. Mm. Oh, so um, I guess um, to add to that, my uh, next question is kind of related to the previous one, but so we've mm. heard from you that earlier you said you're doing an ongoing series of projects about uh, kind of a cross-species ethnography project on Lantau. And the next one is going to be kind of about Lantau's bat population. Um, so I guess that's very interesting because for me, um, there's a lot of like buzz around bats, N not just COVID, but <laughs> um, there's a classical um, Kind of philosophy of mind article by Thomas Nagel, yeah. uh, which is titled "What is What is it like to be a bat?" Because bat relies on kind of their their supersonic soul to um, know their surroundings instead of like a vision, and their sensory configuration is so like radically different from that of human beings. So I guess um, could you just talk more about this? This I know it's a work in progress, but I find it very intriguing. And also, what what can we glean from this kind of technological or artistic embodiment of modern human sensory experience, mm -hmm. and how like that's gonna help us from like or navigating our ongoing crisis, like uh, climate crisis and and, and mm -hmm. extractionism, which is also investigated by the exhibition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, directly um, leading off from the previous question and Daisy's um, response um, and this question of empathy, um, one of the starting off points for like thinking about bats is was, um, there's a field of uh, research in VR amongst like psychologists and and, um, and human computer action kind of experts of animal embodiment. So basically creating um, VR systems which simulate the sensory motor contingencies of being specific animals. And so there's um, like a hummingbird, a scorpion, a rhino, people 
basically create a system where you can physically change into these beings. And the express purpose of this research has been um, empathy. So the premise being that if you can experience what it's like to be a specific uh, non-human animal, another species, another experience, a different ontology, that you will have more empathy for that species and that would lead to different you know interactions and behaviors and change your kind of um, relationship with those animals and so it and it was precisely this like discovering that research and then as you mentioned the Thomas Nagel essay um, that kind of led to the kind of uh, a kind of nexus of these two things and it seemed quite obvious to do that to create well, they, there's this great philosophical question of, in the philosophy of the mind about what is it like to be a bat, which is essentially a question of um, do humans understand um, the experience of another, the subjective internal experience of another, if that even exists, and that with new technologies, you could actually synthesize what it's like to be a bat. And just another point to go back to earlier is um, like some people came to us at the opening of the exhibition said well it's not really what it's like to be a buffalo and that's again the point that we're not synthesizing we're not trying to create a cyborg water buffalo or a, a bat it's actually finding the minimal conditions the minimal threshold of what it would take for someone to begin to imagine what it's like to be a water buffalo or a bat like we're providing the this like the, we're trying to discover the minimal stimulus that can basically set off someone's artistic imagination, creative imagination, to go into that place. Um, and so, um, yeah, we decided to uh, engage in this project. And I, I guess just to, um, uh, so the basic premise of uh, Nagel's essay was a thought experiment, a philosophical thought experiment um, asking the question, is it possible to uh, know what it's like to be a bat? And if you could create a system where you could experience every uh, motor faculty of a bat, would you, in sense, become a bat? Would you understand what it's like to be a bat? And Nagel's essay uh, answer to that question is no, because you can never, even if you could create all the motor functions and sensory functions of a bat you can never have the embodied life experience of a bat and therefore you would never be able to truly experience the, the what it's like to be a bat and so he's kind of merging the body and mind are inseparable and then you can't have the mind without the body and so it's a kind of um, physicalist take on the uh, problem of qualia is there anything existing mm -hmm. Um, so the opposite answer to that would be that, um, yes, you can simulate what it's like to be the bat. And if, if that were possible, then that opens, the, it's obviously leads itself to the conclusion that perhaps um, human consciousness is similarly simul simulable and in a sense, an emergent phenomena of our physiology and kind of the material world that it's uh, consciousness that you can re-simulate consciousness and in that sense you could create artificial intelligence so the kind of two different poles two different directions you can go and this has been an ongoing debate for the last 40 years and uh and and there's a third position now which is that kind of um that to basically the body is inseparable from the mind um similar to what nagel's saying but then it's not an either rule that they're kind of intertwined. And this is kind of the idea of um, embodied cognition. Um, and it kind of takes from inactivism and um, theory of sensory motor contingency. And um, so, yeah, our, our, our approach to this is um, it's hopefully it's just a minor contrib contribution using te technology and um, kind of using. Um, approaching it from this anthrozoological perspective and focusing on the place we're actually living in and looking at the bat populations here trying to create a, a, a technological system which simulates um what it's like to be a bat and uh, let people experience that um and yeah yeah thank you Royce. that's that's really fascinating we really look forward to how this series of work continue to develop
Um, I'm realized that we're a little bit, um, you know, past the one hour limit. Um, I don't know if any if there are any participants that um, have a question. Um, if not, I think we would um, end today's event. But just quickly to say that, you know, um, I, I'm aware that due to COVID related travel restrictions, a lot of us aren't able to go to Hong Kong to experience the mm -hmm. show. But we have a series of public program, including um, guided tours that um, virtual guided tours in both Chinese and English that will take place in the next few weeks, um, as well as the event with Zhong Bo that will happen uh, in two weeks, which will definitely be quite fun. Um, so please um, pay attention to our website. Um, and these pub this coming public program uh, events will be uploaded. Um, I don't know if Julian has anything to say to um, all good. I, I think that it's fascinating the answer. It goes so deep. I have to. Uh, I need to like um, revisit Nagel. About it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Daisy. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Daisy and uh, Royce. Yeah. Uh, so, do do you? Yeah, we just want to say too. Thanks for um uh le yeah letting us being part of the show because it's it's been nice to to uh, have you know a work about kind of Lantau like you know we've been here so long now and and find I think this has been a great space for sharing some of these ideas so yeah thank you thank you for letting us taking part thank you so much really appreciate it thank you and thank you for everybody that that have joined us for the for the for the event today um right. and bye bye, bye. Thank, you. thank you thanks for joining